Hey, what is up guys? Hello again from the Web Dev Cave channel. I'm Ayub and I'm gonna be talking about the microservices architectural pattern in this video. We've seen increased adoption of this pattern over the last years as a better alternative to the layered and the service oriented architecture and a lot of new and hot buzzwords are attached to this pattern in the field like continuous integration, containerization, etc. So let's explore this pattern and see what it's all about. First, I'll start off by describing the pattern and explaining basic concepts that are related to this approach. After that, I'm gonna briefly talk about different approaches to building a microservices system. Then I'll list some of the advantages and limitations of this pattern. And of course, we'll see how all of this knowledge translates to the real world by working through a simple example of planning and designing for a microservices system. And finally, I'll conclude by listing some of the pitfalls we need to be aware of and some important considerations. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's explain explore the microservices world. In the first software architecture video, I briefly talked about the microservices pattern and mentioned that it is a service-based architecture. This means that the core software components in a microservices application are services. Functionalities and operations are achieved by communicating with service components through REST calls or some other messaging mechanism. This is a simplified illustration of this pattern. And before I go to the nitty gritty of this pattern, let me explain some foundational concepts. First, we have the famous concept of a service. What is a service really? Well, a service could be anything from a single function to a group of classes that cooperate to achieve some sort of functionality. It could be a single file or a bunch of Java modules. The size or the granularity of service is decided in the design phase. And actually, it is an important decision because even though there is some sort of freedom in defining the size of a service and how many functionalities it consists of, we need to be aware of the risk of falling into some anti-patterns like creating layer-like service components. This pattern is called the microservice pattern because service components should be micro or fine-grained. In other words, they should be single action services. And a service have a very specific task like generating PDF invoices, sending emails, processing payment cards, etc. Another important thing to know about microservices is expressed by the father of domain-driven design, Eric Evans. And by the way, the principles of this domain-driven approach is what gave rise to microservices. He said that services can consume and produce messages, which means that service components communicate and interoperate using an event-driven approach by producing and receiving messages or events, if you will. And that's due to the distributed nature of the system, which leads us to the next concept the independently deployable units, which are the services, of course. This means services or service components should not be functionally dependent on other services. They should be independent and separate from each other, which is the whole point of microservices. And the system should be loosely coupled. If a service needs something it doesn't have or cannot do to perform its job, then it needs to call the service that can provide the necessary data to accomplish the task. And that is achieved through the messaging mechanism in place, for example, by communicating through HTTP calls. The third and last basic concept about microservices is the topology notion, which is just a specific way this pattern could be implemented in. Here are two examples of two common topologies. You can stop the video and inspect these two topologies, but we'll talk about them in much more detail in a few. And as we will see, microservices systems could be built using different approaches, and the term topology indicates the specific approach used. So let's go a little more deeper and talk about this pattern in much more detail. Because there could be many ways to implement a microservices architecture, I'm gonna talk about the most common approach and mention where things could be done differently. So to understand the pattern very well, it's better to start from a place we're familiar with which is the common layered architecture. In this architecture we have layers which are relatively big and complex code bases that consists of modules and packages that are dependent on each other. In such systems requests comes from the top level layer and keep going down to the data persistence layer to make some changes and of course the data store aspect is represented by a one 
Century database. All right, feel free to check the layered architecture video to know more about this pattern. At the architectural level, implementing microservices is just breaking those layers into independent functionalities, which of course will introduce new challenges in what it seems like problems, like duplication of functionality and data, etc. But it's well worth it, and I'll talk about that in a few. So we break down the monolith until we get to the point in which the application's major components are services or microservices if we don't want to confuse the concept with the service-oriented architecture pattern. Before implementing this architectural pattern, the major components of the system were layers, which encapsulated those services in an interdependent manner, meaning that services in the layered architecture were tangled and dependent on each other and existed in one place, which is the layer. After implementing microservices, these services became independent and the major components of the system for the most part became microservices. These service components could be all distributed over a network, they could be in one place or somewhere in between these two extremes. It's actually the engineer's call to make that decision. And it's important to note that the system only takes care of the service side of the application. One of the reasons for choosing this pattern is to have multiple representation layers. But if you are serious about implementing this pattern, you could also break down the presentation layer into composite UI and that is beyond the scope of this video. Also, there is some sort of freedom in terms of data persistence for such systems. You will find microservices systems in which there is only one centric data store and all service components talk to the same database. Such systems tend to be smaller in scope and not that big and complex. And of course, not all of those service components will have to talk to the database. On the other end of the spectrum, you will find systems in which every single microservice have its own data store. In such systems, there is a data sharing mechanism to coordinate between services data stores. Databases and data sharing in microservices systems is another big topic. So this means what we call microservices systems are systems in which the applications as well as the business layers functionalities are turned into service components using some of the common topologies, namely the API REST based topology, the application REST based topology, or the centralized messaging topology. These are different but common approaches to implement this pattern. And of course, there are more than three approaches to build microservices systems, but let's be content with these three and let's take a brief look at the first approach, the API REST approach. This topology is used for small to medium applications that have a small number of service components and most of the time, the services are fine-grained, meaning that they are single-action services and they perform only relatively small actions. And so, this approach makes more sense as calling and communicating with these services hardly affects the overall performance of the system. Such systems are characterized by a relatively thin REST API layer in front of the services that can be used by clients to access the functionalities of the system. Think of a lightweight API gateway layer that performs only simple functionalities such as routing. This layer is deployed separately and it calls the necessary services as clients make requests to the system. Another common topology is the application REST topology. This approach is similar to the first one. The difference is, instead of a thin REST API layer in front of the services, you'll find an entire usually thick user interface layer. And depending on the system, this thick client app could be used directly to call the services or indirectly through through a thin API layer. The layer could be even an entire web application that does much more than REST calls to the microservices. In this approach, the system tends to be larger and a little bit more complex than the first one. Also, service components in these systems are much more larger and coarse-grained. And by coarse-grained, I don't mean service-oriented architecture services. What I mean is just in this approach, service components tend to be larger than services in systems that are built using the first topology. And the last approach I want to talk about is the centralized messaging topology, which is kind of a similar approach to the service-oriented architecture messaging mechanism that uses a message broker. It's just in the microservices pattern, it's much more lightweight. In this pattern, the message broker is not as sophisticated as the service-oriented architecture messaging middleware. It does not perform any of the big tasks like message conversion, orchestration, or anything like that. A message broker 
software in the microservices system allows for more control over services and the communication mechanism in place, such as synchronous messaging, error handling, etc. And so, requests coming from clients need to pass through two layers, the user interface layer and the message broker, before reaching service components. These are just some approaches we can use to build microservices systems. And as I said before, there is some sort of freedom into choosing how to implement this pattern. This decision takes into account many considerations that eventually impact the way the system is built. Now, let's talk about some advantages and challenges that are specific to this pattern so that we can make better decisions. One of the reasons microservices came to exist is the drawbacks of monolithic systems and the difficulty to scale them. And so, a big advantage of the microservices architectural pattern is scalability and extensibility. In microservices, the system is fragmented into independent services that could be built, maintained, and deployed independently. And so scaling is so easy. If one of the service components is getting more requests than usual and starts getting under pressure, we only need to scale at the service level. Another benefit of microservices is the future-proof nature of this pattern. Through well-defined interfaces, service components can be changed and updated in a breeze. Whether it's optimizing an algorithm, switching to the new hot technology, or even changing the implementation of the functionality. Also, and it would sound natural to you as you might have guessed by now, if I say with microservices, deployability and testability are even easier. And again, that is at the service level. Reusability of the service component is another advantage. And another great benefit is that now with the promising technology of the cloud, containers, etc., the microservices pattern is becoming the first thing architects and designers think about when considering systems that need to operate on the cloud. And last but not least is fault tolerance. Because failure of single modules do not jeopardize the system, dealing with unresponsive and unavailable services is easier and quicker. However, this doesn't mean microservices is the silver bullet. Here are some challenges microservices systems face. One of the problems of this pattern is the extra work that will be added to the normal day-to-day -day tasks of the developer such as maintaining service contracts, monitoring, etc. Another issue the microservices pattern is known for is the problem of higher latency and slower request handling because of the many chain calls that need to happen before the preparation of the response is done. And so if performance and speed is a requirement for your system, you may not want to implement microservices. The layered architecture is better in this case, alright? And due to the distributed nature of the system, monitoring as well as transactions are difficult to handle in microservices systems. And another problem that is introduced by this pattern is testing at the application level. Again, that's because of the distributed nature and the complexity of the system. Of course, there are workarounds to these problems, but this is why various architectural patterns exist. All right, now let's briefly discuss how to plan for a microservices system by going through a simple scenario. The first step we need to take is to determine if microservices is suitable for your project by evaluating the trade-offs and whether do we even need the benefits of microservices. How to do this is beyond the scope of this video. The only thing I can say with regard to this is that, as I said before, microservices is not a one-size-fits-all solution. There are actually situations where other architectural patterns are better, okay? The microservices architectural pattern is flexible and so is designing for it. For this reason, there are many variations as to how to design and build a microservices system. Nice. So we've decided we're going to do it the microservices way. The next step is to grab a pen and paper and start sketching and outlining. We need to identify the main functionalities of the system. We'll most likely get layers instead of microservices and that's okay. What we need to do next is to decide the scope of service components we want our system to be composed of. That is to say, the define the granularity of the services and their boundaries. This decision is based on a lot of factors. How big or how small should the service components be? What functionalities they will contain? How complex the functionality is? It's good to go by the single responsibility principle. Microservices should be, well, micro. However, there are exceptions and it's possible to have thick coarse-grained services that do more than one single action in the system. And based on the results of this step, we will break down the layers into relatively simple pieces of functionalities in the form of independent units. And one important thing to keep in mind regarding this step is that it is nearly impossible to get service boundaries and scopes right from the outset. A healthy and sound granularity in microservices mature over time through trial and error. The next logical step is to design the interfaces or the API. 
APIs or the contracts. They all mean the same thing. We design the APIs for each individual service component. These APIs need to be well defined and depending on the system, we may need to consider the possibility of external entities using the service. So following and respecting the standards would be a good choice. After that, we could start defining the API layer that will be used to call the main functionalities of the system as a whole. Next, we should determine how service components are going to talk to each other. Most likely REST-based messaging will be used, but we can always choose another method if it is better. And you can refer to my video of REST APIs to know more about the most common communication method and interoperability approach used in architectural patterns. Of course, we need to decide what we're going to do concerning data persistence. Are all service components going to talk to one single central database? Do they need to have their own data source? Depending on the answer, we'll base our next move. Of course, there will be more decision making and design involved in the process, but these are the most common important decisions that will guide the development of the system. Okay. We know that with great power comes great responsibility. This applies to software architectural patterns as well. The flexibility and variety of options the microservices pattern provides could be a bad thing sometimes. Because too many options also means too many pitfalls. For this reason, as developers, we should watch out for anti-patterns and pitfalls and we need to keep in mind important considerations. Data migration is an error-prone and risky process. Thus, it is important not to split data from the very beginning during the development of the system. Following domain-driven design principles, it may be tempting to create as many bounded contexts as service components by getting each microservice its own data store. Doing this will introduce data migration and data sharing issues from the very beginning. And most of the times, going this far is not even necessary. A good solution is to split only functionality at first and only split data when necessary. Handling service components availability and responsiveness is another issue that needs to be dealt with carefully. Using a timeout value, for example, is a good technique to handle unavailable and problematic services. All right, let's proceed. Even though microservice architecture goes by the share nothing principle, sharing security services and other functionalities that are essential to most or all of the service components is better sometimes to avoid higher latency and other problems. But if we do this, we need to watch out for too many dependencies because this will break the bounded context principle. A very good technique that is used concerning this issue is implementing service templates, which are substrates on which service components are built. A service template is extended to include the functionality of specific business or infrastructure services. Service templates ensure each service has the required infrastructure to operate and be monitored by including features like logging and monitoring and things that need to exist in each service component in the system. One good example is to include authorization and authentication logic in the service template which will reduce latency because now we have the logic into each service right there and we don't have to call another service that is specialized in that. Of course, this is one of the trade-offs you need to make because this means duplication. And there are quite a few other pitfalls to watch out for when building microservices. For instance, a common pitfall comes out as a result of the flexibility and versatility of the microservices pack. Being able to build a hybrid system may lead to an explosion in technologies and a very mixed system that is difficult to maintain. Another one is the static contract pitfall, which happens when the service component team forget or doesn't want to version the contract between the service and the service consumer. And this will introduce brief issues such as lack of backward compatibility and difficulty in being responsive to service clients in the future. These are common pitfalls when building microservices systems and of course there are more issues and traps to watch out for. It's really important to follow well-known microservice architects such as Martin Fowler and Chris Richardson and read blogs and books regarding this architectural pattern to avoid reinventing the wheel and falling into anti-patterns. One good thing is that microservices architectural pattern is starting to to get mature and there is more to it than I could cover in this video or even in a series. But I think this should be enough to give you an idea and get your feet wet. And before I leave, let me tell you about some great and important resources to deepen your knowledge in designing and building microservices systems. First, two important and must-read books for developers and architects in order to grasp the principles and techniques behind a microservices architectural pattern are Building Microservices by Sam Newman. This is probably the most common book on the topic. Another famous book is Domain 
and driven design by Eric Evans, which represents the philosophy behind marketer services. And don't get tricked by philosophy. It is a very important book for developers and it equips you with the tools and techniques to build future proof marketer services systems with your own custom implementation. And if you find this book too long and daunting, Domain Driven Design Distill is a concise and clear version of the original book and is also a good valuable source. I also want to mention a good source on probably the most important aspects or issue if you will in microservice pattern which is data persistence. This is a free ebook written by Edson Yanaga on database migration for microservices testing. Finally, microservices.io by Chris Richardson and the microservices section in Martin Fowler's website are two common and well-known blogs among developers on this architecture pattern. You can find the links in the description below. This was a long video and I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. And if you learned something new from it, please hit the like and subscribe button and make sure you hit the bell icon as well to know about my next videos. Thanks for watching and till the next video, stay tuned.